Thank you, Samuel. Good to be with you all. Linda, I don't know in what universe in Africa there's a snake that I would want around my neck. <laughs> they all seem to be pretty poisonous there. Um, and as Linda was saying, she was pointing to some colors here. Seventh-day Adventist Church is not a liturgical church. However, uh, many of our churches have come to recognize, as I have discussed uh, here before, the kind of ebb and flow of seasons. So we usually do something around Christmas, for example. We usually do something around uh, some of the American holidays or international holidays, New Year's and Fourth of July. But we also do things then around Easter and so forth that fit within that so-called Christian calendar, right? So this calendar also has a component uh, in both Catholic and Protestant uh, settings called the lectionary that gives a guide so that when a planner of worship or liturgy is working with a church, every three years, most of the scripture gets addressed. Not every single text, but many texts get addressed. And so this seasonal flow of year A, B, C, and then the things that go through and mark each particular year were part really of a society, European society mainly at the time, English society, that had a sort of uh, bucolic and um, agricultural and uh, non-sort of technology-driven rhythm. Sunset was sunset. There was oil lamps, but there wasn't electricity. Same with sunrise. You were dependent on rains and the seasons. And so this sort of marker of time spiritually also had a corresponding marker of time that we're disconnected to physically in our world. In the city, it's concrete all the time. In the city, we might have sweltering days over 100 and we might have cool days in the 40s, but we have concrete and buildings and artificial light and the capacity to set our own hours and people running and going and doing 24-7. So we're disconnected a little bit from it, but I want to draw on its wisdom anyway for just a moment because as I became aware of it years ago, it fit something for me spiritually, remembering that we were entering into a season in which we would celebrate the birth of Christ. It was more than just Christmas, and it was more than just Christmas tide. And marking that time in which Christ ascended to heaven or the apostles received the Spirit at Pentecost. Remembering Christ's resurrection from the dead and all that surrounds it. These sorts of seasons gave some sort of structure, bones, to a spiritual rhythm of my life. And there was what's called ordinary season marked by this color green that liturgically I ignored, essentially. It was not a bad thing that I did that. It was just a time for me to speak to whatever I felt was most relevant in terms of the needs of the congregation. What I've come to discover is that while there may be an ordinary time in the church calendar, when it comes to life, there are no ordinary times. Because I had thought that life would progress a certain way. Maybe because of my upbringing, maybe because of my privilege, maybe because I had parents, or grandparents, who didn't speak to the hardships or challenges that they inevitably faced. Sometimes I think intergenerationally, we do a poor job of talking about what it means to be an adult. There was a time when it was just given that you would honor your elders or you would respect your elders. But the problem with that came is that we found that we sometimes were dealing with elders who weren't knowledgeable, it seemed, at least in the things that mattered technologically or scientifically or in terms of the age in which we lived. Because we have to remember for centuries, things were done the same way, more or less. Knowledge progressed rather slowly. 
As of 10 years or 15 years ago, knowledge was doubling every seven years, and I have a feeling it's doubling even faster now. So to stay current with what the world knows, with that body of knowledge, with technology and everything else, is a whole different thing than what our great-great-grandparents experienced. And so through that time, we've come to be a youth culture. It's the youth that keep up with these sorts of things, right? Sometimes we had elders who weren't necessarily wise. We saw them make choices that didn't make sense. Somewhere along the line, this sort of traditional value has, had, has, has come to be more of almost ceremonial or of uh, courtesy level, not anything really deep. And I think part of the problem is that our elders haven't spoken to us or we haven't listened, maybe more accurately, about the wisdom of life lived in the seasons. I sort of thought life would be very straightforward. I don't know what I was thinking. Every year brought a new challenge. First grade yielded to second or kindergarten to first and so forth. Leaving one homeroom at my little tiny school for another homeroom and a new teacher was a whole new set of challenges. Getting over being a total jerk in seventh and eighth grade was its own challenge. Moving into high school and trying to figure out you know, who I was in light of all the changes that were happening in me physically and mentally and spiritually. Moving to an academy setting that was literally 50 times as big and as many number of kids as I was dealing with in my grade and far more diverse. And trying to manage all of that and get through that and then pick college, a college and then a career or at least an academic course that would lead to a career. You've all been there, most of us have been there, you, you remember these, these things. And then of course, once you're career uh, headed, you kind of think, well, what am I gonna do for companionship in life? And all that's shifting too. Friends, did you know that this year, 48% of all children will be born to single mothers? And we can shake our heads, or we can say we have a tremendous opportunity for ministry ahead of us. But society is changing fast. And when I was going through, you tried, if you could, to marry and then have a family. So I looked for a spouse and found one. And lucked out, by the way. I'm, I married well above my state, yes. And a child followed and movements in our careers, respectively. And I thought I would get to a point where I will have raised a child, I would have done a certain amount of time in my career and have a certain level of expertise and respect and be able to slow down a little bit, I'd have a little more money, I might enjoy life a little bit more. I thought maybe that uh, I would have a, a, a decade or two before my parents really started failing or there were other things to tend to. I looked forward to some sort of what I would have called ordinary time. And it just doesn't exist. So if somebody hasn't told you that before today, I'm telling you now. And if you're looking at me going, poor thing, he should have known this a long time ago, that's okay too. Glad you figured it out. Sometimes I am a little slow, I will admit. The wisdom that comes to us from Scripture is in part about the fact that there are no ordinary times. Life does not go in a linear fashion or in the way that we think it will. In today's world, you're not done raising a child when he's 20 or 22 or 25. The raising continues. We're now realizing that most people have what's called a late adolescence 
and that the corpus callosum, which connects the two hemispheres of the brain, is fully myelinated, that is to say covered in a cholesterol sheath that makes the energy between one half of the brain and the other flow very effectively. That happens at around 26. The prefrontal cortex is completely baked, so to speak, somewhere between 25 and 27. That's where our critical thinking skills are. With my son who loves adventure and speed and all these things, I've just been saying to myself, if I can keep him alive until he's 20, 22, 24, now if I can keep him alive till he's 26, each year that goes by, the chances of him doing something stupid that cost him his life drop. <laughs> and it's not because he's not a bright kid and a good kid. It's because the prefrontal cortex is in its final stages of baking. And so parenting wasn't what I thought it would be. And career-wise, how many of you, Americans in general, so I expect a lot of hands here, how many of you have felt that your salaries were flat for 20 years? That's what's happening in the United States. Salaries have essentially been flat for 20 years. That's where I feel like I am. I don't have the abundance that I thought I might to be able to do the kinds of things that I thought I would be doing at this phase. And I didn't realize that my uh, parents were so vulnerable. I'm stepping into more and more of their care or saying goodbye as I did to my father last fall. And it's not just a tiny demand. Caring for parents can be overwhelming not just from a physical point of view, but if they haven't taken steps to downsize their estate, and you can see me afterward for a little monologue on that, please do downsize your, size your estates, those of you that are in the aging process. If you're 60 or older, you ought to be thinking about what it looks like to downsize in the next 10 years. Seriously downsize in the next 10 years. If they haven't done that, then there's all of their things to deal with. And of course, I'm lucky because I have friends who are saying, yeah, we're going through that too. We're dealing with that too. There's unexpected health things that arise. And very tragic pieces, like when you lose a friend. And we've all lost a dear, dear friend recently. It's hard to get my mind around. But scripture would encourage us to look at things not in terms of whether or not they're as we expected. It would encourage us to look at these things in terms of the full race that is to be run. The marathon that is our lives. Turn, if you will, to Psalm 126. Psalm 126. I have it printed out, but I'm going to look in the actual text too. This is a song of praise, of a sense. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Let's just pause there. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion. That's the ebb and flow of life. That's the ebb and flow of God's people. Fortunes gained and fortunes lost. Freedom from captivity and captivity. Peace in the nation and invading nations and war. It's described very well in Ecclesiastes. There's a time and a season for everything. 
And when things are going well, it's easy for us to praise the Lord. It's easy for us to look up and say, yes, we can, we can sing with joy. We can laugh. God has done great things for us. We can look at those who are doing well and say God has done great things for them. And then the passage goes on. Restore our fortunes, Lord, like the streams of the Negev, these seasonal waters that come in to the desert. Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. An agricultural metaphor, waters in the desert, planting and harvesting sheaves, and the end of all the struggle, the dryness, the waters, the floodwaters, the drought, the planting and the reaping, the labor of it all, the uncertainty and seasonal flow of it all, the upshot is that there's joy. The upshot is that there's reward. The psalmist has described it agriculturally, poetically. But now let's turn to Paul and look at the way Paul may actually be writing and thinking about some of these things. In my letter to you, I told you that I, I think I have always interpreted Paul in terms of persecutions. I've always interpreted him in terms of the more dramatic Uh, pieces, justification, sanctification, righteousness by faith, um, the struggle with flesh versus spirit, some of these kinds of things, and they're definitely themes in Paul. But if we turn to Romans 5, I think we can find space to understand that it's a little beyond that. I have somehow disconnected what I've written here with what is. Well, Romans 5. Um, I'm going to pass on that and just go to this uh, passage, the source of which says, Therefore, actually it's Romans 5.1. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we've gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Stop. So we have this thing Paul is talking about theologically, this grace in which we stand, justification through faith, peace with God, reconciliation with God in Christ. We have access to grace in him. And this is where we live, is in this place of grace whether it's an ordinary season or extraordinary season. We boast in the hope of the glory of God. But we also glory in our sufferings, he goes on to say, because we know that suffering produces something in us, perseverance. Perseverance produces character, and character leads to hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, M. Scott Peck was right. Life is hard. And the sooner we come to terms with difficulty and challenges of life, the sooner we're in a position to embrace mental health. Because mental health requires that we have expectation that life will not be easy. And that there won't be seasons of ease. That anything can go wrong at any time. That our lives may feel under duress, challenged, oppressed, put upon, difficult. However word you want to say, at a loss. When we look at 2 Corinthians 1, 3 to 7, Paul offers this doxology. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. The God of all comfort. But listen to what's next. Who comforts us in all our troubles. 
It doesn't say removes us from all our troubles, delivers us from all our troubles, keeps the troubles away from all of us. It says who comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort those in trouble with the comfort we receive from God. And here is what church is, friends. Here is what spiritual community is. It's not escape from the troubles of this world. It's being able to comfort one another because we've experienced the troubles of this world. Whether it's loss of a job or a child. Whether it's a setback in terms of our net worth or whether it's a gain. Whether we're hospitalized for something dramatic like an accident or whether we have invisible disease processes that will one day cost us our health. We're going to have troubles. They're going to come. So the question then is, how do we encourage one another? And it says here, we do so with the comfort that we have received from God. Our comfort abounds through Christ. For if we're distressed, it's for your comfort and salvation. If we're comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same same sufferings we suffer. And our hope for you is firm because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. Paul is being pastoral here, and sometimes he just says things in such a way you go, what was he really saying? But what he is saying is that I'm going through an experience so that I can share that with you and bless you in that experience. So that the comfort I receive from Christ I can pass along to you as you have trials and difficulties of your own. We can share a tear, a hug, a word about the journey. We can hold one another up for the moment when our knees are ready to buckle. We can take some steps together. And because Christ journeys with us and upholds us and comforts us and sustains us, because Christ is with us all the time through his spirit, spirits with us. Because we have this hope, this peace, this faith, the journey becomes endurable. It becomes bearable. It becomes something that we can fulfill. Just a couple more texts. James 1, 2 to 4. I never liked this text much. But liking it or not liking it doesn't make it part of our scripture. It just means that we have to deal with it. It says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters. James 1, 2 to 4. 2 to 4. James 1, 2 to 4. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. What I don't like is consider pure joy. Maybe because I've met people who think that that means always being happy. It doesn't. We are built to experience the full range of human emotion. There are seasons of anguish and depression. There are seasons of joy and dancing. Scripture makes that very clear too. So when it says count as pure joy, it isn't that you are all happy and giddy because something has gone wrong in your life or the life of someone you love. No, that's not what it means. It means, and here's another overlay. We tend to think of count it pure joy as count it as happiness. For us in the American culture, these two ideas are related. Happiness is related to joy, but they are not at all the same thing. We think God wants us to be happy. That isn't what Scripture says at all. It says that He wants us to be saved, He wants us to be righteous, and He wants us to be joyful. And to be joyful is something much deeper than being happy. 
To be joyful is to live in the certainty that God is journeying with us, turning our challenges and our sorrows into victories and into joy. He has turned my mourning into dancing, the scripture says. It takes lots of time sometimes for that to happen. Tears and hugs. Setbacks and progress. But what Paul is really getting at here is that it's joy because what happens in suffering is that we develop a sense of patience. I don't mind telling you. I sat at my mother's hospital bedside this week. And I did something I've never done to her before or with her before. She wasn't in really great shape. And as she was in her hospital room, there wasn't a lot we had to talk about. So I got a book, and I read her the book. I just sat and read. Now, I did this with my child all the time. I read to my son every night, sometimes falling asleep in his bed and waking up later and going to my own. You all remember those days? Maybe you didn't. That's what I did. But I'd never read to my mother. She had read to me all those years, but I hadn't read to her. And I sat. It took a patience that I wouldn't have had three years ago, or five years ago, or ten. I could see her differently. I could love her differently. I had the patience to sit in a hospital room and read. I'm not, by the way, exalting myself in this. I'm simply saying, dealing with her sufferings have produced patience, at least some. I got a long way to go. A long way. And this testing of my faith is producing perseverance. What I'm realizing as I age, and I'm not old yet, thank God, to some of you I'm very old, to others still a bit of a spring chicken. I know that dynamic well. It's all relative. If you're 20, I'm old, 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 old. If you're 85, I'm looking pretty good. If you're 95, I'm a virtual child, and you'll instruct, take me over your knee if you need to, right? The point is, it doesn't matter what our age is, it doesn't matter the season we're in or what we're going through, it may matter to us in terms of how we're feeling. But what matters is that we recognize that this is not a, life isn't measured in a day. It's measured in the whole journey. Have we developed perseverance? Can we finish the race? Can we somehow, with all of the pain and difficulties, all of the health setbacks, all of the losses, all of the disease, all of the war and trauma, That's our daily news. All of the threats, all of the uncertainties. Can we go through life and persevere? The question is, can we take what happens and turn it into faith that will allow us to persevere? I think that's what Paul's dealing with. I always thought it was set into all these settings. You know, he's like, I've been stoned, and I've been imprisoned, and I've been all these things for the cause of Christ. And I think, well, I haven't yet been stoned or imprisoned or suffered a shipwreck or had a snake bite me that was venomous. I haven't had any of these sorts of things happening. So, you know, maybe there's a deficit somehow in my journey. The scripture isn't just, Paul particularly isn't just talking about the trials and tribulations Our text for today says God is not going to test us or tempt us more than we're able to endure. What does that mean? Sometimes I think that text can't be true. I'm dealing with more than I can endure. That's how it feels. 
But what it means is that our faith ultimately is going to be sustained because we've persevered. We've chosen to hold on for yet another minute. We've chosen to hold on for yet another day. We've chosen not to cash in our chips, not to call it quits, not to lay it down. God, whether we feel him or see him or recognize him, is near and will be with us even to the end. 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7 says, In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Praise, glory, and honor when Jesus is revealed. What happens to us in the course of suffering is worth more than gold. That's why we're to rejoice or count it pure joy. 1 Peter 5 goes to that piece I was talking about earlier with the elders. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and witness of Christ's sufferings who will also share in the glory to be revealed. Christ suffered and we suffer also. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you're willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted you, but being examples. And when Christ, the chief shepherd, appears, you will receive the crown of glory that never fades away. In the same way, you are younger, submit yourself to your elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because... God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. It's another thing. It's really difficult in this life when you experience trials, setbacks, and troubles to, be, to live in the land of the proud. It's a way of being humbled. And verse 6 says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he might lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Listen to that context. We give God our worries and concerns because in the end, he cares for us and all of this is to our good. Somehow, all of this is to our good. I don't know how. But this suffering produces character and hope and perseverance. The things that are worth more than gold. Be alert and of sober mind, your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, stand firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kinds of sufferings. We're all undergoing the same kinds of sufferings in the end. Maybe not at the same time, maybe not in the same quantity, maybe not even qualitatively the same sufferings, but we're all dealing with something that can move us to faith or destroy us. I'll tell you what somebody else never told me. I understand that youth are at risk when it comes to faith. First of all, a child has to grow up and differentiate his or her own faith from his parents' faith. And then as a child progresses and matures, a child has to decide what of his parents' faith or her parents' faith is worth holding on to and what isn't, what they're going to let go of. And then they've got to decide out of what they've held on to what that's going to look like in terms of their habits and practices Will they be involved in worship and community or no? All all children make this decision. And we lose in the Adventist church a great deal of our youth as they enter college and young adulthood. And historically, we've been able to count on a high percentage of them coming back when they had children. I don't know if that will be the case going forward. There's good evidence to suggest that it won't. But nobody told me that my particular phase of life would also be a challenge to faith. Nobody told me that at my age I would be at risk of losing faith. That you're at risk, some of you who are my age, of losing faith. Nobody nobody mentioned that. And Paul is encouraging all of us. He's saying, 
don't lose your faith. The devil is going around like a prowler. He's taking out whoever he can at whatever season he can. Lock arms and limp to the kingdom together. That's what he's saying. Lock arms and limp to the kingdom together. You're going to get hurt in this life. You're going to have setback and pain and disappointment and sorrow. Lock arms and limp to the kingdom together. Resist standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kinds of sufferings. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you've suffered a little while, life is just a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong and firm and steadfast. After you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace will himself restore you and make you strong and firm and steadfast as with the psalm. When the Lord restores the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter and our tongues with songs of joy. This was said among the nations. The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. And we're filled with joy. Verse 11. To him be the power, and I would add praise, forever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn is hymn number 340, Jesus Saves. It's available on screen or in your hymn book in front of you. Thank you. <laughs>